Hey, this is Brendan. Doing my reflection Sunday morning. I thought I'd take a tip from some of the other reflections and do it while walking. You can see I'm walking Daisy, my dog. I get almost as much energy from trying to hold her back as I do from walking. But uh, anyhow, um, this week in at MOOC we're talking about digital citizenship and digital literacy and all those digital things and uh, a couple of weeks ago I did a presentation on it made my own did it for the teachers in my district and it was sort of starting with digital footprint because I don't I think the the first problem the most important problem with this digital citizenship stuff is people don't realize how much stuff they're giving away uh, I think we have an idea that we're not very private but we have no idea exactly how much information is going away and even when we start do realizing there's nothing you can really do about it I mean um, your all your phones and your apps and stuff they're always asking for information they don't really need like <clears throat> where are you when you're playing this game and what other things you click on and your phone number and your phone ID number and all this other stuff and uh, you know you don't have a choice you either do it or you don't and it's changed in the last couple of years where you know you can refuse to give some of this stuff away and still play the games but uh, you know it's still not as good I mean this this idea this problem you know it's it's corporations and companies taking advantage of individual citizens and and not enough people individual people just don't have the strength to to uh, fight back and even if they do you know you have to you have to get together with other people you have to become a group to uh, to uh, have enough power to, to make changes and and the problem with that is uh, getting enough people together in one group is uh, is difficult because you have to explain it to so many people and then there's so many variations and, and whatnot that uh, keeping the group together is, is difficult keeping the group united behind whatever uh, policies you want to change is difficult um, so but that's a larger political problem too um, citizenship and literacies like great topics the idea that there's not one digital literacy I think is a you know it's one of those Eureka that's so simple ideas but um, it is is crucial to what's going on the, the idea that uh, um, <clears throat> you know okay I can be literate in using a, a computer I can be an expert in using wikis but uh, that doesn't mean I'm uh, literate in all web 2.0 tools I'm not literate in all things digital um, I may have a leg up in learning new stuff because a lot of these skills are transferable but uh, it doesn't mean I'm literate in everything so there's that idea uh, the eight literacies and I'm not going to try and remember them the eight aspects of being digital lit digitally literate as uh, proposed by Doug Belshaw um, or Dave Belshaw, Dan, whatever, something with a D. Uh, that idea is, I think, uh, very interesting. The, the idea that uh, you know you have to you have to understand the use of the tools in culture in the culture you're in. Uh, you have to be courageous enough to to jump in and, and try things. Um, you know, you have to be able to communicate and collaborate with them. These ideas are. It, it, it really expands on the idea of being literate you're not just someone who can read and write in these subjects but you you really I think in, in essentially can communicate uh, in all senses of the word you know you, you get not only your message across to the people who you want it to go across to but they don't necessarily well anybody who's 
literate in the sense, can, can read it and understand it. So, like if I wrote a book, someone who can't read cannot understand it really. But uh, anyone who can read can understand it. So anyone who's <clears throat> passively literate can understand me. I don't know. It's a really big topic. I don't really understand it. I'm trying. I do understand it. But I don't. Not enough to explain it to a five-year-old. And that's the understanding that we kind of want. Really. Maybe, maybe that's a simple definition. <laughs> being digitally literate is being able to explain how to use these tools to a five-year-old, you know, but I don't know, I find you, explaining how to use digital tools to a five-year-old is a lot easier than to a 55-year-old because I tell the five-year-old, well, here, here's how to do this, now go ahead and play for a little while, <clears throat> and, you know, hours, days, weeks later, he asks me questions, and then he goes back and plays some more, you know, well, so there's that. Um, forgot what else I was going to say, so, but, uh, we're only halfway through the walk, so I can get, continue talking. Come on, dog. So, I don't take her walking enough, she explores. She doesn't go potty, though, she just explores. But, uh, uh, alright. Um, I've noticed a lot of, uh, the good teachers and administrators, well, not necessarily the administrators so much, but the good teachers I know on Twitter, online, blogs I've been following, almost all of them now have the title consultant next to their name. So I'm looking into that idea. What does it take to be an educational consultant? Um, I love my job. I love the people I work with. Um, but I'm tired of not being able to make my bills every month. Borrowing money from family and friends and all this other stuff just so I can, you know, pay the bills. And yeah, my hours aren't bad. I, sometimes I work, you know, the other night I worked till 10 o'clock at night because I had a presentation to the board. But, uh, you know, then I can do some flex time on that because they're not going to pay me overtime. So. I can leave early the next day if I wanted to. So, thing is, I don't really want to all the time. I enjoy going into work and doing it. But, uh, you know, really, it would be nice to get a little extra money. And I do like teaching this stuff. So, <clears throat> start uh, really working on my presentations and honing them down to something really good. And, uh, doing some presentations, going out to, uh, I guess I'll start with uh, uh, these conferences and become one of these small presenters who I assume presents for free just to get their name out there and then, uh, you know, join a consultancy group or something like that or maybe just start my own. So if you know anything about that kind of stuff. Let me know, because, you know, uh, unfortunately the education world is, is weird, different than the business world. Uh, you know, th that's the thing that bothers me a lot about the education world. We want to make it like business, but it's not. In business, me, with my experience and my education and just my track record, if I were in the business world, you know, and I went looking for a job, people would be calling me back all the time. Uh, you know, I'd be able to move to a job. They, they kind of expect it every couple of years that you might move around. But, uh, well, it looks like there's a rabbit behind that rock over there. You can see the trail. We must have surprised him because the trail is not gone. Anyhow. Um, so... You know, I wouldn't have a, it wouldn't be a problem the fact that I have worked for four or five different companies in the last 12 years. <clears throat> because that's the way it works. But in education, I can't get a job as a teacher because I'm too expensive. You know, 
there's some of these charters who say they want they'll pay you a hundred thousand dollars but they don't want me because I'm steeped in the too steeped in the traditional culture of you know teachers should have autonomy in the classroom and while I love data and I think the idea that you know we pretest students and, and look at some of these scores and, and, and you know use student work to decide uh, to determine where we should go in the future the idea that we should test them so much with standardized testing and, and the idea that that's even useful work you know my idea of data gathering is um, a pretest at the beginning of a unit to determine what parts of the unit I might want to emphasize more than others uh, it might be observations during the class day to say to determine who knows what who's learned that day it might be uh, small quizzes it might be what work they do it might be um, uh, individual conferences with students you know all these things to determine what exactly it is that uh, come on Daisy she's deaf she can't hear me uh, to determine what it is that uh, my students understand and don't understand and what my how I should modify my next step in my lesson that's data uh, having a kid miss two weeks of school uh, to shut down the computer labs in the school that I may or may not use because I don't have a computer in my classroom or I only have one in my classroom <clears throat> to interrupt the, the regular education of my students so they can take a big test which then I don't get the results for weeks that's not good data that doesn't help me in the classroom that helps a politician it doesn't help me uh, so, you know, that's kind of useless. So th that idea of data is stupid. The idea of data should be what I find in my classroom today so that I can modify my lesson tomorrow or even today, you know. So, uh, I don't know where the heck I was going with all this stuff. Just walking and talking stuff. I, I don't have an outline to follow. Kind of like my writing. Anyhow, um... So, what uh, what sort of things can I talk about? Uh, uh, what sort of things can I present? Um, this digital citizenship stuff, I, I think I can present it. I'll learn more about it as I present it. I mean, it's kind of like teaching. You don't really understand it until you try and teach it. Um, it's like any other subject. Uh, also, um, you know, I, I, I think... I have this w wonderful idea in my head that, uh, especially in elementary schools, we kind of flip the LMS model instead of having our students in the learning management system as students, have the parents in there as students. And then they can check the website uh, whenever they want for, instead of giving out homework, I can say, this is the unit we're working on and, and here's some Here's a variety of things you can use in your home to help support the learning. You know, um, if I teach a different way of multiplying, here's uh, three different YouTube videos on, on how to do it this way or why this way works. Um, so that you don't come back and say, what is this newfangled math stuff that you're teaching my child? Uh, but more than that, you know, those individual consultations with students, I, I can record them and, and share them just with the parents instead of everybody. <clears throat> uh, it makes standard-based grading so much easier because I can, um, I can uh, record sessions on a standard or record work that the student has done and put it in there and, and go send it just to the parent. Look. Your child has mastered the standard. Here's how they did it. Um, you know, some proof in the classroom. And then for the uh, summative assessments later, you know, uh, if they change or not, I can, I can show why or talk about why. Uh, if they improved or, or dropped down a little bit. Uh, parents can message me individually. We can have discussion boards as a class parents instead of a class. Uh, 
make it a lot easier to set up classroom parties and stuff too because parents can do that right in the class. So, and the parents who don't always volunteer can actually be part of it. I don't know. So, I'm building something like that as an example. You know, I find it hard to say, I'm gonna teach you how to do this when I don't actually, have never actually done it in the classroom. But, you know, we'll see. Anyhow, oh, almost home. So we'll sign off for now. And thank you for listening if you got through this whole 15 minutes. I am amazed.